Well, hello. Um, so, for, my name is Michel Bowens. I'm the founder of the P2P Foundation, which is a uh, collaborative, a global collaborative doing research in um, peer production, peer governance, and peer property. So, any occasion where people work together to create value together, um, that is what we study and try to understand. And I'm here with uh, Nicolas Mendoza, who is from Colombia, by the way. Nicolas, maybe you can. Tell our audience who, who you Thanks. are. Hi, I'm Nicolas Mendoza. Uh, I'm, I'm working with Michelle for over a year now. Uh, we created the report on the collaborative economy that we're going to talk about. Uh, I started working with the P2P Foundation after I finished my master's in global media and, and communication in Melbourne. And I'm also working for Al Jazeera and very soon I'm going to start, be starting a PhD researching these topics in Hong Kong. Yeah, by the way, Nicolas has a really interesting PhD. His uh, project is to compare uh, what he calls analog karma, so the merit system in Buddhism, which um, kind of gives value to people who do good deeds and, and, and help the community, and compare with the analog karma, the, all the system metrics we use on the internet uh, to reward contribution, so uh, that will be an interesting study. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, first of all, I, I want to stress that um, the way we look at the internet uh, is maybe a bit different from uh, most other people. So we don't look at it just as a communications medium which helps people communicate and eventually uh, cooperate. What we look at the internet is as a a means of production, a productive resource that allows people to con to aggregate, uh, build and construct value together and actually in that way also uh, create a new type of economy with a new type of logic. And this is basically what uh, you will find uh, if you check out our report. This was done for Orange Labs uh, about two, three months ago. And it's a 300-page overview of the deep transformation that is being uh, that is taking place in our uh, global productive resources. And the way we um, we talk about it is basically we talk about the great horizontalization uh, of that happens through the internet. Um, so basically, a way to imagine this is that uh, it has enabled people to communicate without asking permission on a horizontal scale. Uh, it has allowed people to cooperate on a global level, so basically it allows for the global scaling of small group dynamics. And uh, finally, uh, it produces value uh, together, and that's what we call peer production, and I, I will return to that. Um, so basically the report uh, starts with um, with the thesis that when vertical institutions meet horizontal dynamics, what you get is a di diagonal adaptation of both the top-down institutions and the bottom-up community. So the first two chapters of the book are dedicated to describing how corporations are adapting to these community dynamics. And then we have two chapters on um, basically on what we call peer production and distributed infrastructures. Nicolas, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, just uh, I think it's worth uh, asking you to uh, go a little bit deeper in explaining that difference between the vertical institutions, what they are, and uh, the horizontal dynamics. Right, Try right. to make very clear yeah. that, that difference. Okay, well, well, basically, uh, so we define peer-to-peer -peer as a relational dynamic, as a particular way that people can relate to each other by contributing to a whole. And this is, so first the internet is not a gift economy where you give something to another person and then you accept, you expect something in return from that, from that person. Uh, it, it's something different. It's basically you're constructing and building something together, like the Wikipedia, like Linux, uh, like the Arduino motherboard communities do. And um, so this is what we call peer production, the common creation of value. Then we talk about peer governance, which is how do you do that? How do you manage conflicts? How do you organize these processes where if you're contributing to a common project, but you're not in a salary relationship with each other, you are freely associating uh, because you both want to do something uh, 
that is similar. And finally, we talk about peer property, which is how do you defend the common work from private appropriation? Now, peer governance and peer property make a lot of sense if you think about it. What, it, what, what do you need to motivate somebody to contribute to a project? So imagine that you would vol volunteer uh, to do a lot of work and you have no say over that process. That wouldn't be very motivating. That would actually keep most people from contributing uh, to that project. Uh, similarly, if you are contributing as a community to create something, uh, let's say the Wikipedia, and then somebody says, it's mine, I put a copyright on it. So it privatizes that common work. That would certainly discourage you to continue to work uh, for that project. So peer governance and peer property are really correlated and co-emerge uh, with peer production. Now, I think we can distinguish between a top-down dynamic and a bottom-up uh, dynamic. This is what I try to, to explain. So top-down economy goes with names like co-creation, co-design, crowdsourcing. And the common, the common point of these processes are that it, you usually have a corporate entity that tries to integrate community din dynamics in its own value chain. Uh, but it wants to keep control of that value chain um, and therefore it kind of integrates the community dynamic in its own uh, vertical institutional functioning. And there's another way though, which is you start from the bottom up, uh, you create value together. When the community grows, you, you have new needs and then you create an institution uh, and then eventually it creates an economy around it, right? And this is a bottom up process that actually creates a new economic, political and social logic. And I'd like to maybe explain that briefly how, how that logic works. So the first thing is at the core of the new mode of production, you have a community of contributors, free or paid. Some people volunteer, some people that can actually get paid uh, by a corporation, for example. You have a commons because the, the code, the knowledge and the design is deposited in a common pool. And this is, this is really new. In the, in the older system, you have private players creating value and they privatize that value. They uh, put intellectual property on it. In these uh, this new forms, we have shared property that creates the common pool. So it means that everybody who works for that project, but also people from the outside, can actually use that common pool uh, to create more value. Um, the third aspect at the core is what we call the collaborative platforms. So uh, these people need infrastructures to work with. Like for example, again, I'll take the Wikipedia as an example if it wouldn't be able to buy all the servers that are needed to, to accept so many viewers, it, it would uh, not be able to continue to exist, right? So usually these, these groups, uh, whether they are open source software or um, open knowledge or open design, they create what I call four benefit associations. They're usually non-profits, but they're quite different from classic non-profits because they don't tell people what should be done. What they do is they enable and empower the collaborative processes so that they can continue to exist in the future. So we have the Wikimedia Foundation, we have the Apache Foundation, we have the Linux Foundation, Gnome Foundation. So this is a new player, which we call the Four Benefit Association. Um, for benefit because they're not for profit. They're for the benefit of the community, for the benefit of the commons, for the benefit of the collaborative uh, infrastructure. The third player is the entrepreneurial coalition. The entrepreneurial coalition are all the businesses which grow around the commons and create added value on top of that commons. Uh, so this is again very different from the classic model uh, because uh, you are not enclosing the common value. Uh, the, so you work with the commons and with the community and you create added value for the market. So what's the difference between both? The commons dynamic is concerned with abundance. It has a point of view of abundance that you will always find contributors to grow your project on the condition that it can be used by every, everyone. While the market players uh, create scarce services on top of the commons. That can be education, that can be training, etc. The sixth chapter of our report is actually dedicated 
to open business models. In other words, how do you create an economy when you don't have intellectual property rent income? You can only uh, do business by creating real value around the commons and creating real products and services around it that uh, people uh, actually want. And so, of course, the classic example is the open source software economy. I just want to briefly mention that a recent report called the Fair Use Economy, uh, which talks about open knowledge, open source software, uh, but also all the machinery needed to operate it, like the Android and the Linux computers, uh, already reaches about one-sixth of GDP. So this is an important economy that is already operating within the mainstream, but has a different value logic to it. Um, okay, so uh, maybe a, a word about chapter four and five. So in chapter four, we discuss the, specif the specific characteristics of peer production. I'll, I'll give you two or three examples to show the difference between classic industrial production and this new modality. So first of all, uh, industrial production is based on division of labor. People are paid, they have a role, and they have to fulfill that role. Uh, peer production is based on distribution of tasks. So basically you have a communication system that let people know what needs to be done and allows them to allocate their resources to that task. Uh, so this is called by scientists uh, stigmergy, which is basically the language of the end. So we have an open system of communication that allows people to aggregate their skills to what is needed by the common project. Again, very different from the classic pr uh, uh, process, which are based on panoptism, only the top of the hierarchy knows everything. Here we have something that we call holoptism, uh, the whole, all the members of the community know what's going on within uh, the project and when they have conflicts we have something called negotiated coordination and we are moving now into companies that uh, practice open supply chains and open logistics and open accounting and to open up even their material uh, cooperation to each other. Um, just a little example, uh, this is a Brazilian company, it's not a big one but it, it's kind of um, an example of, of how things can be done. So it's called Curto Cafe, and I, I met these people in Niteroi, which is uh, just across Rio, across the bay. So the first thing they did is open up their supply chain. So you can see where this company buys its coffee from. And they teach the coffee producers to roast their own coffee with triples their income. This is already a very different, uh, kind of very different uh, practice than, than an, a normal coffee company. Uh, the second thing they do is they do research and they have four blends but the research is open so anybody else can also experiment and add to this research based on creating blends of coffee. Um, interestingly when they want to expand they use crowdfunding so they actually crowdfund their retail operation they ask their community for funds so do you want to, to be present in that mall in your neighborhood if you like our coffee? Yes then give send us money and and, and that's how they, we pay the rent uh, so they they also apply this and finally um, a little anecdote they also actually hack the nespresso uh, boxes um, so they can people who use their coffee can refill uh, the little uh, boxes uh, without having to buy this very very expensive uh, coffee uh, for the nespresso machines um, so chapter 5 is distributed infrastructure. So our point is simply that um, no matter where you look in the production system, there is something going on which we call distribution. Now distribution in, in the P2P sense has a very specific meaning. Think about centralization. One player controls everything. Think about decentralization as groups compete with each other and share the power like, for example, the division, division of powers in a democracy, which uh, executive, uh, legal, the legal system and the parliament system uh, balancing each other out, or the different political parties balancing each other out, or different big companies. But distribution is when individuals can directly participate in the production process, because they either own their means of immaterial production, the computer, which allows you to produce and distribute knowledge, but more importantly, the means of 
material production. And, and so it's very important to understand that everything that we've seen with the Internet, which has become possible through the, the distribution of knowledge production, is now becoming possible increasingly through ma in material production. And, and really, basically, uh, for example, the 3D printing machines allow you to uh, print an object using plastics, uh, using metals. And uh, the image that you see here on the cover of our report is actually from Minecraft. And uh, some people have made 3D representations of the virtual cities that they built uh, in Minecraft. So this is just one example. But of course, uh, a much more serious example would be Wikispeed, for example. Wikispeed is very interesting. So about 80 people in about three months' time created a car that drives. It has a five-star security rating. And that uh, has a 100 miles per gallon fuel efficiency. So about five times better than what uh, the commercial industry uh, offers for the moment. They've done this without any capital. They produce the car in a micro factory environment using a set of 3D printers, which allow people to assemble the car a bit like a Lego uh, block uh, system. Every module on the car can be improved worldwide. So this is worldwide. So this is very important. We are going from a linear production system where everything you do is in a chain and needs the permission and the authorization of the hierarchy to a system whereby anybody in the world can improve any module in that production system. And the, the hierarchy moves from prior to the work to a control function for the quality of the work after the work has been done. So this is a, also a quite a, an important change. Wikispeed has converged with another project called Open Source Ecology and to develop actually a full methodology to do this, which is called extreme manufacturing. And this is important because the system we have now is basically the result, in, in a major way, from Henry Ford redesigning the industrial production system by putting different patterns together. And so the fact that we now have a methodology for massive parallel distributed design is really very important. It's a tipping point that shows that we are moving uh, toward distributed material production. Um, so this is uh, what we discuss in chapter uh, five, actually, so where we talk about distributed infrastructures. Um, okay, uh, one more uh, example, maybe briefly, finance, right, where we have um, crowdfunding, seeking money from a community to invest in a project and we are now have a law in the United States which allows equity-based crowdfunding. We have social lending, the ability to borrow from each other without passing through a bank. And finally we have, uh, and this is also quite exciting, we have Bitcoin which is a peer-to-peer -peer currency which is produced by, uh, through participating computers according to a uh, algorithm and uh, cryptography, which has a trust of a whole community worldwide and which is now functioning as a global scalable, globally scalable reserve currency. And uh, Nicolas, next to me, uh, actually enabled the Wikispeed team to accept bitcoins for Wikispeed spare parts. Now, this is an important part, and I, I will let Nicolas explain a bit about bitcoin, but this is a very important. Historically, if you would look at the 16th century, for example, you would have seen that in the 13th century, the Templars had, inv had invented double book accounting to keep track of the gold uh, going to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the Catholic Church started talking about purgatory uh, from the 11th century onwards, which basically allowed bankers, which would otherwise go straight to hell because of the... Uh, the uh, injunction against uh, interest allowed them to buy um, indulgences, uh, which was basically buying off your sins, and which then build the cathedrals for the Catholic Church. Um, so basically, what I'm trying to say here is that we have these different patterns emerging in the 16th century, including, of course, the big one, print, the really big invention. And these patterns, even though you may not know what they would what they would mean in the 16th century, if you look at the 18th century, you would know. These were the building blocks of capitalism, right? 
all these patterns would eventually congregate, aggregate in a new logic of value creation. Um, so, Nicolas, do you want to say anything about uh, Bitcoin? Uh, yes, well, <laughs> what, I, what you were talking uh, about um, the coming together of Wikispeed and Bitcoin, uh, as you explained, Wikispeed uh, enables the, the, the building of cars, and that's like, at least symbolically, it's very important that uh, you can have a P2P car now. In reality, and that is actually in many ways superior to to cars made by huge corporations. Um, and on the other hand, you have the, this this new thing, which is Bitcoin, uh, which is a currency, which is P two P. That, as uh, our our whole culture is telling us from since we were little kids that money is something that can only be created by huge entities like banks or governments. And um, it turns out that uh, in 2009, uh, the, uh, this protocol was created and, it's, um, and it, it is actually a working way to create a currency that is safe and that it's um, instant and that it's autonomous from all the powers that are creating the money in the world currently. So the, the point that I want to make is that um, when, when these things come together, then uh, it shows that there is, there is uh, a whole new potential in the world, I think. Yeah. When you, have a, you, you can make a P2P car and pay for it with a P2P currency. It's a whole different world. Yes. Although it's not today in the streets what we see uh, outside but this is this is the, what what's coming next it's clearly something yes. and, and so so basically if, if you look, um, our main thesis is the following which is that p2p infrastructure infrastructures are emerging they are growing very fast and there is an acceleration a number of tipping points are being reached so for us uh, P2P is inevitable. So it's not something that we think is a hypothesis, it's something that we actually can see happening in a faster and faster way. Now that doesn't mean that the future is for foreordained. And I have created a, um, a quadrant system that actually makes a hypothesis of four different futures. But they are all based on the idea that P2P is there as the infrastructure, right? So basically Imagine you have two axes with polarities. One is between the polarity of centralized control and distributed control of P2P dynamics and infrastructures. The other axis is a for-profit orientation versus a for-benefit orientation, or in other words, in a way, markets and capitalism versus the commons. These are polarities. That doesn't mean that they fully exclude each other, but they are basically choices that you can make and you can go you know, far or less far in choosing them. So it gives us four quadrants. One is centralized control over uh, P2P infrastructure, but with a for-profit orientation. And this is what I call netarchical capitalism, the hierarchy of the networks, netarch, netarchical. And the good example is Facebook, right? Facebook allows P2P dynamics, people can share information with each other, they can communicate, they can organize projects. But at the same time, you don't choose a design. You don't own the servers. Uh, they have an exclusive right to monetize uh, what's happening in the platform. Uh, so this is a system uh, which, of course, uh, contributes to the creation of those, those platforms which people use massively. But at the same time, we really see an imbalance there, right? Because we have an exponential rise in the creation of use value in, in the sharing practices. But at the same time, the uh, monetary value, which only grows linearly, um, is um, monopolized by these netarchical systems. And it's easy to imagine that a capitalism which doesn't pay for people to create value also doesn't create the feedback loop that allows people then to buy whatever is produced. So this is a problematic hypothesis. Um, 
and it's based basically on rentism, on, on extracting value from other people. Uh, so you don't create value yourself, you extract value from other people. Um, then we have distributed control with a for-profit orientation. And I put Bitcoin there because Bitcoin is designed as a, uh, as a scarce currency. Um, and, um, and it's also driven uh, quite a bit by libertarian in the American uh, uh, sense of the word. So anarcho-capitalist uh, dynamics. And basically the ideal is that everybody can ch exchange, everybody can trade, everybody can create private value without interference of the, the big government or the big corporations, right? But it has that market orientation. It's, it's a money, it's actually uh, designed as to be a commodity. You can buy and sell bitcoins uh, on the marketplace. Uh, so this is what I call distributed capitalism. And why is this important? Well, because if you look at a project, you have to look at, is it just distribution but doing the same thing? For example, social lending, if you, um, and now I, I really have to do something because, uh, as you maybe know, this is a tropical environment. This is Chiang Mai. And it's, it must be around 24 degrees outside. And, of course, the echo makes too much noise for the recording. So let's let's continue with that. <laughs> All right. Um, I lost my thread. Uh, yes, distributed capitalism. So social lending, why do you do social lending? Because I can make more money doing social lending than going to a bank. Why do crowdfunding? Well, maybe because I can get money from the bank, so I will get it uh, in another way. It, so it, it, in other words, it doesn't really necessarily entail a for benefit or a commons orientation. This is what we have now in, in when we, we look at the two next quadrants. Um, so imagine distributed control with a local uh, focus, community focus, and with a for benefit commons community orientation. So this is what I call the local res resilience movement, which is uh, growing very rapidly local food system, local money systems, now, a little critique for me on that uh, scenario is that it doesn't look to the global situation, it doesn't look to the planet, it, it doesn't keep the ball in its eyes, the planet Earth ball, right? And so this is where we get the fourth orientation, which is a global orientation. Uh, here, centralized control is not the right word because we are talking about commons, but a global commons orientation. And this is basically what we try to do with our work in the P2P Foundation is that we actually want to change the world. So you want to use the internet and all these uh, means of production that are emerging from it as a enabler for social change around the central idea of the commons. Now to conclude, because I see the, that we are nearly reaching our 30 minutes, how would such a world look like? And we're basically extending the logic from peer production as it already happens today. So this is not a utopian vision. This is extending what we're already doing. So at the core, we have a commons, a series of commons. So the society consists of a series of commonses, digital commons, but also natural commons, the sky trust, the ocean trust that protect our common resources. Then we have the partner state, which enables and empowers social cooperation to occur. So it's not a welfare state, it's not a corporate welfare state, it's something new because it, 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 it enables cooperation. And finally, we have new market players. Market players that are common, commons friendly, and I think this is an important point, I think we should be working as commoners doing peer production, creating commons, we should work in priority with the ethical players in the economy. So we still have a market, we still have a state, we still have a civic society, but they are arranged in a different way. And I will just conclude to say why this is so important in terms of the survival of the planet. If you design as a corporation, you design for scarcity, you design for planned obsolescence. It's not a bug, it's a feature, right? We make an iPod so that it can break down after 400 charges and you can't change it. Uh, but a community like Wikispeed designs the car uh, with a biodegradable material that you can change all the time. You can change any part of the car and continue to drive with your car. So this is very important that we design from the point of view of uh, taking into account the ecological limits of the planet 
And communities who design, who do open design and peer production naturally do that. So we have a vested interest, I believe, and I conclude with that, with changing towards this new system. And so if you want to find information about this, uh, you basically go to our website, which is p2pfoundation.net. It's a non-profit endeavor to document the emergence of peer production, governance, and property. We have 18,000 articles in every domain of human practice. Uh, Nicolas, is there anything else you want to add before we close? Gracias. Hasta luego. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, because uh, this is a Colombian uh, audience, of course, that uh, Nicolas Mendoza is a compatriot. And so as a co-author of our 300-page uh, report, I, was, I really am very happy uh, to work together. So thanks for your um, attention. I, this may have a bit boring, you know, one man talking, but I hope at least a little bit uh, of the passion and the, the, the excitement of this new field uh, will, will pass through the, the wires. Thank you so much.